Welcome to the Fellowship of Cambridge Drive Community Church in Goleta, California. For those who are unable to be with us on Sunday mornings at 1030 in our park, we offer this online presence. This video today will include a first a scripture reading, a prayer of invocation, a second a scripture reading, the sermon Abiding Love, the Gardener, the Vine, the Branches, and the rest of creation. And then we'll celebrate communion and the benediction. Jesus can be traced in history when he was subject to the laws of physics. And here in, is one of his messages, abiding love, the gardener, the vine, the branches, and the rest of creation are together and they interact together. The kingdom of God is in us and around us. Jesus, the Christ, we and he experience the fullness of God. We experience in Jesus Christ the full experience of God. Let us worship together. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 22, verses 26 to 31. And it reads, The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise Him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before Him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and He rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship, all who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Amen. And now let us pray. Loving and compassionate Father, Holy God, God of abiding love, you made the world in beauty and restore all things in glory through the victory of Jesus the Christ. We pray that whatever your image is, still disfigure by our arrogance, wars, selfishness, sickness, poverty, and greed, the new creations, our resurrections to abide in love might bring the power of your Holy Spirit to discover a new mission, a new journey, a new adventure in justice, compassion, cooperation, and peace. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, the Christ. Amen. Our second scripture reading is found in the book of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. And it reads, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He takes away every branch that does not bear fruit in me. He prunes every branch that bears fruit so that it will bear more fruit. You are clean already because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit, because apart from me you can accomplish nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown into, uh, into the fire because it dries up, and such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned out. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is honored by this, 
that you bear much fruit and show that you are my disciples. Last week, we concluded that a transformative movement is not supposed to rise up when the leader is dead, when the, lead, when the last breath is gone, it's not supposed to continue. But the message is quite the opposite. The dead that you are looking for is no longer here. He has risen. Separateness is an illusion. Everything is interrelated in time, space, and our very beings. Both religion and science reveal this truth. The experiences of the mystics, the teachings of ecology and physics, even the internet shows this truth. Spirituality, then, is the art of making connections. One thing always leads to the other. Everything is related to everything else. You practice connections by consciously tracing the links connecting you with other beings. Any point is a good start place. Your family lane, your work, your backyard, and even this connection today. As we celebrate the fifth Sunday after Easter, I invite you to consider that Jesus can be traced in history when he was subject to the laws of physics. And here is another one of his messages, a binding love, unshakable love. The gardener, the vine, the branches, and the rest of creation, they're all interconnected. The kingdom of God is in us and around us. And Jesus the Christ, we experience the fullness of God. This passage of John chapter 15, 1 to 8, I realize can be uh, dissected in many ways. It can be studied in many, many, many forms. And I realize that this passage also has been used for many purposes in the past. Some to instill fear, some to instill shame, some to instill separation. Some so it's still duty to work harder. So many interpretations that we can find, including that Jesus is teaching gardening 101. Today, I invite you to bring a different approach to this passage, a approach of creativity. This suggests that we can take the passage as a whole, as a poetic sacramental passage. In this sense, the passage is about a binding love. And when we think about that, then you see the picture complete. The unshakable love unites them all. They're all related. I don't want to go into details about that, but I want to explore with you today the meaning of a binding love. A binding love as an unshakable love among the gardener, the pine, the branches, the fire, the fruit, the soil, even the fallen branches the, the, in the rest of creation. Abiding love that produces life, a becoming love, a way of being. Becoming and being a better person, experiencing community again, the community Jesus talked about, the beloved community, the kingdom of God, a kingdom without a king. Abiding love in the poem means to learn at least the following four lessons that I bring in the suggestions of Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. He says, number one, that love has at least four dimensions. First one is that abiding love can be understood as friendship. When we love, we offer our friendship, our brotherhood. This friendship and brotherhood does not deprive you or the other from freedom. It is important to understand that when we offer love, we are saying to our friends that they are free. You maintain your whole freedom and let them other maintain their whole freedom as well. This abiding love, this friendship, is what makes us equals. A friend must be willing to understand another friend. That is the first element of abiding love. 
a love that endures, that abides, that constantly offers friendship, a relationship. So you can see the picture. The gardener takes care of the plant, prunes the plant. But the pruned branches that will not produce in fruit are not just taken away. They become part of the whole picture because when they decay, they become food for the same plant and for the rest of the plants that's around that plant. The fire that burns the branches that dried up also creates a process that ends up in ashes. And those ashes also become part of the system in the relationship. So when we think about this aspect of love, the abundant love, the friendship love, we're talking about being equals. We all have a part in the process of life. We all have a part in the experience. And that is love. That is why the central message, this abiding love, this bringing together, is for me the message that I want to convey to you. That we cannot be separated, but united. And bring, this love brings us all together, again, as equals. The second aspect of this love, the abiding love, has, is that this love has the capacity to understand the suffering in others and the willingness and capacity to help transform that suffering. We are abide, we are together, so that we can support each other in our different challenges of life. Those who we love are experiencing problems of many kinds, just like as we are. But loving them means that we are present to help transform that suffering. During this five or seven years working with hospice, I have learned one thing, that the most important ministry being around families that are suffering is just being. It's just being there. It's not the art of using my words. It's not the art of making a great note. That is not the important, that's not the essence of the mission of being working among the people who are dying. It's just being. It's just wanting to be there with them, even if it is for 15 minutes or 30 minutes or two hours. The time is not important. It's the relationship that we develop in just being there, just being together. Real love cares about other suffering, and it is here to help in the transformation that the other person is experiencing in their problems and difficulties. You do not have to make those problems yours. That is another thing that I have learned. I cannot be of help if I make the problem mine. You are here and there to understand like a doctor does, to help the roots of the problem without feeling the pain of the patient. Because after all, when you ask what it hurts, you must believe that it hurts. The doctor cannot tell the patient what is pain because the one who is experiencing the pain is the patient. So if a doctor wants to help, the doctor must listen carefully. The doctor must be willing to understand the suffering. Just to say, I hear you saying that you are suffering. I hear you saying that you are in pain. That is important because we are showing the abiding love, the capacity to understand. Helping with compassion helps others to feel better, to be better, to become better. When you sit down with people who are suffering, all they need is our attentive ears, our full attention, our presence. And that aspect of love is important in all our relationships. Whenever we are willing to develop the capacity to understand the suffering in others, we are, we are developing in us this abiding love that Jesus is talking about. Number three, another element or aspect of this abiding love is that it helps experience joy. If you make others cry, 
too many times, then you probably need to ask yourself, why am I making people cry? We're supposed to make people enjoy life. If you make others suffer, if you inflict pain with your words, with your presence, then you do not understand the love that Jesus is talking about. Our love must have the capacity to make others comfortable, joyful for who they are. Our love must help others experience joy so their pain can be balanced. Pain and joy bring a balance to life. Laughing, looking at the eye, and just relaxing in front of the person that we have or acknowledging that this person is there, it's a moment of joy. Have you tried? How expensive is a smile? Have you tried to smile to somebody? It really is not very expensive, but it does require the love in our hearts. When you smile to people, they'll smile back. And if they don't smile back to you, you keep smiling, eventually they will. This is the element that connects us. This is the message of being connected with the bind. It is a poetic message. When we see others happy, we are happy. When we see that they are advancing, what they are achieving, we become also happy with their achievements. Our love, our love must, help, must help others feel the joy of being alive. In love, we cannot say that uh, that expression of, this is your problem. In this love, we actually cannot say that because we care. We are united in love and we must be able to care for what the other is experiencing. If a patient tells me that it's in, he or she is in pain or affirms or just by looking at the face that shows that there must be pain, my next action should be that I care. And therefore, I should ask the nurse, look, this patient seems to be in pain. Have you given the pain medication? Is there something that you can do to alleviate this situation? Sympathetic joy. My joy is your joy, and your joy is my joy. We cannot make others cry all the time. We love others, no for what they have, but for who they are, because we love them. It's just the love that we learn in God. We are united in this binding love that is the message in this passage. Number four, a binding love producing produces equality and inclusiveness. We need this element of love so much to heal ourselves, our families, our communities, our nation, our world, our common home. Our love must include the other side. Your love, for instance, I hear a lot of people saying, I love my current president because we agree with what he is doing. But that love at that moment is incomplete because it doesn't produce equality, inclusiveness. We also have to think about the former president, the prior president, because he is part of life. He is part of the whole picture. And half of the other part of the nation is after him and his ideals. So we must love him and love them too. The passage offers us a better message, the message of Jesus, loving our enemies. Loving includes those who are different from us so we can bring equality, so we can bring inclusiveness to our experience of life. This passage is not about who is thrown in the fire, but a poetic message to understand the meaning of a binding love. Not dividing love, where you set the bad people and send them to fire. You set them apart and send them to, into the fire and to hell. And keep the good ones 
who produce fruit. This passage is a call to practice a more profound and higher love, a love that heals, a love that affirms, a love that hopes, a love that heals, a love that awaits, a love that transforms, a love that is present, that unites, that has compassion, a love that cooperates, a love that brings us back together, a love that heals wounds, a love that avoids destructive criticism, a love like the love of Jesus Christ without conditions. Let us come to Jesus, the vine, to unite to him, to abide to his love. Richard Rohrs reminds us, and I have quoted this, and I quote it again. This is the meditation of Richard Rohr on 3.12.21. And he says, We don't go to heaven. We learn how to live in heaven now, in this very moment. No one lives in heaven alone. Either we learn how to live in communion, abiding to other people, and with all that God has created, or quite simply, we are not ready to experience heaven. If we want to live an isolated life, trying to prove that we are better than everybody else, or believing that we are worse than everybody else, we actually have already created a hell. We are to live consciously in a binding love. That is the invitation of this passage. That is the message of Jesus in the communion that includes all, the gardener, the vine, the branches, the fruit, the dry branches, the fire, the soil, and the rest of creation. This must be an almost perfect way to describe what salvation means for us today. What does St. John know that we don't know? Maybe that we tend to treat love as a kind of a goal-oriented affection. We tend to love. We love so that we can get what we want, so that we can achieve our selfish goals. That is not a binding love. That love will not last. And it will not get us too far to accomplish the mission that Jesus is giving us. Because we do not love as a means to achieve some and align with restoration, love, and justice of our Heavenly Father. We do not know how to love, but we love because God first loved us. God loves us and lures us to experience our way of being more elevated, a binding love, love to unite, love to heal, love to dignify, love to rescue, love to give hope. The love that unites is the highest form of performance of love, of being, of being present, uniting with others for the community. If how we love is only a selfish desire to possess, then we need to learn a binding love. We must look deeply to see and understand the needs of the person or the people we really love. A binding love is the basis of real love. Understanding occurs when we are present for the other, when we remain in the same way as Christ remains. Not a burden, but a presence. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask what you want, and God will help us to achieve it. This is a permanent awareness of the presence of Christ in our lives, and an ever-increasing capacity to remain with others through the love that unites us, that binds us together, to welcome new adventures, to welcome his mission. The psalm that we read ends this way. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. 
This is the word of God for all the people. Glory be to God. Amen. And now I invite you to bring the elements, the sacramental, the symbols that unite us in love. The bread and the cup. And let's remember what Jesus did. He took the bread in that last meeting with his disciples. And he broke the bread and he gave it to him. He said, this is my body that is given for you. We welcome the abiding love of Jesus. I, as a servant of the Lord, I invite you, let us eat. And after they have finished the meal, Jesus took the cup and told his disciples, this cup represents the union that we have, the abiding love, the distant remembrance of me. Let us all drink. We thank you, Father, for your abiding love. May that keep us together, building your community of faith. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Now let us close with this benediction. We bless you, Father. You fill with your spirit all things with a fullness and hope that we can never comprehend. You are love, which is the source and destiny of experience. Thank you for leading us into experiences where more of reality is being unveiled for us, all to become aware of Christ around us and in us. Thank you for your call to many resurrections in order to prepare us for our next mission, adventure, guided by your abiding love. We pray that you will take away our natural temptation for pessimism, rejection, fear, and depression. Help us have the courage to wake up to greatest truth, greatest modesty, and greater compassion for ourselves and one another. Open our eyes, open our ears, help us to love, grant us compassion to cooperate for the well-being of our families, this community, this country, so many of those who are suffering, including our common home. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father, may the compassionate fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us. Amen. Peace be with you.